I'd like you to think back to the last time that you got on a plane. So believe it or not, you put your life in the hands of people with superhuman capabilities. And I'm not talking about the pilots, I'm talking about the air traffic controllers. There are about 25,000 of them that handle the 1.7 million of us that fly each day in the US. And what they do is amazing. They do fast mental calculations, they weigh risks, they make decisions with life or death consequences under considerable pressure. Now, air travel is not the only place we rely on these superhuman performers. We need them in hospitals, too. Nurses in charge of hospital units, they are the air traffic controllers of healthcare. They make decisions on how to allocate precious resources, such as beds, without really knowing for certain what's going to happen next. The truth is, we need them beyond the hospital, too. We need more superhuman performers than we have. They run our factories, they run our trains, they deal with emergencies, they run our military. Very few of us could do this job well, no matter how much training you gave us. And the costs of failure can be tragically high. So how can we solve this? In my work, I ask, what role can machines play in helping people to do these jobs? It's a fair question, because machines can be quite good at things that individuals are not good at, and vice versa. But machines are typically better at people at performing these sorts of resource optimization and scheduling tasks, doing jobs like the air traffic controller. But there is a catch. The machine will ultimately only solve the problem that you define for it. It's people that are able to tackle an ill-posed problem. It's people that are able to find new approaches, and it's people that are able to find a path forward when there doesn't seem to be an option. As long as machines continue to fall short in this way, it makes it virtually impossible to replace people in these roles. So I don't have a solution to that, but what I do know is that if we were to effectively blend the capabilities of humans and machines, to blend our unique strengths in decision-making, we could transform countless industries, from air travel to healthcare to factories and many others. Our challenge is that most of us are stuck in this either-or mentality. Either the person has to do the job or the machine does it. In my lab, we see a different option. We look to design machines that understand us, that learn from us, and work with us as teammates to help shore up our weaknesses. So I want to give you an example to show the difference between the two approaches. So imagine you've been working on a team with a set of people for weeks or maybe years. You know each other so well, you can do the job with your eyes closed. And then one day, someone brings along someone new for your team. He comes to you. He doesn't know anything about how you do your jobs. He doesn't care. He's had training separately from you. He does most things differently than you. And what's worse, he is sure that his way is the best way. So probably this person is not going to be liked very much. They're going to cause you some headaches. But what's worse is they may degrade the performance of your team. This is how we design intelligent machines today. We design them to do tasks based on their strengths, not ours. We train them to do their tasks separately from the people that they're going to be working with. So naturally, the air traffic controller or the nurse would be mistrustful or suspicious of this machine. Under these circumstances, I would too. So imagine a different scenario. You're working on your team, and a new team member comes along. She's had some basic training, but other than that, she's ready and willing to watch you learn how you do your job, and then brainstorm to figure out how to support your team in doing even better. What's better than that is she's ready and willing to work evenings and weekends long after the rest of your team goes home. <laughs> so that's the team member I want on my team. Um, I assume the same is true for you. So how do we accomplish this? Well, the first thing we need to do is design a machine that's able to reverse engineer how we do these tasks to understand our behavior before it can take the next step to collaborate with us. What we effectively want to do is watch this nurse do their job on the hospital unit and reverse engineer the strategies and rules of thumb that they use. This is hard because we can watch them for quite a while and really only see them do this job in a very small number of the huge number of possible situations they may encounter in the future. Not only from the small data do we want to learn the rules, but we need to learn when to apply them. We need to learn when we take action, and we also need to learn the judgment to not take action, sit and wait to see what happens. 
So the way we do this is we apply a set of model-free techniques that are inspired by the page rank algorithms that are used to rank the websites in response to a search query. We've recently been able to show for the first time that these set of techniques can learn the heuristics and rules of thumb for solving resource optimization and scheduling problems. The way we showed this was we generated a huge data set, half a million situations of an optimization problem uh, that involved task allocation and vehicle routing. So we were deciding what tasks, what packages to put on uh, trucks, and then what route those trucks should take to drop off those packages. It has a lot of similarities to the type of job that an air traffic controller or the nurse does in charge of the hospital unit. So we took those half a million situations, and then we gave the machine 0.3% of them to learn from. And the machine was able to learn those rules of thumb and the correct application. It was able to correctly learn the rules and apply them with up to 95% specificity and up to 96% sensitivity. This is enormously exciting because it gives us a first indication that machines can learn from people in these settings. So now that the machine could watch us and learn about how we do our job, the next question is, is how can it use that information to figure out how to collaborate with us effectively in new situations? What we want to do is give the machine this model and allow it to essentially practice, to simulate, to practice on evenings and weekends. So we conducted experiments in the lab. We had a person work with a robot to do a laboratory tabletop planning task. And we gave the robot a model of how the person might make decisions, not necessarily a very good model, a statistical model. You never know what people are going to do. But it took this model, and it simulated, and it simulated, and it practiced and practiced. We brought them together, and we gave the person and machine a new task variant to work on, a novel task that neither of them had seen before. And what we were able to show was that the person and robot could achieve high team performance on this new task. This is incredibly exciting because it meant we were able to preserve the person's innovation and creativity in confronting this novel task, even when the task required cooperation with the machine. So machines can help individuals in these types of settings, but can they help groups? Can they help teams? This is a really important question because often decisions are made by teams of people, by multiple members of a team in a disaster response team, or by nurses communicating across different units in the hospital. It turns out that, yes, machines can help teams of people improve as well. We investigated this by looking to see whether a machine could help a team of people having a conversation to form a plan, if it could help them develop a stronger consensus around what they agreed upon, what we want is for everybody on that team to leave the meeting with the exact same idea of what to do next. If you're on a disaster response team and you leave your meeting with different ideas for what to do next, that is not a good situation. So it turns out that we can train a machine to do this because the ways in which we exchange information related to building consensus look very similar no matter what we're talking about. So as an example, if we're deciding where to go for dinner tonight, and I say, let's go to my favorite Indian restaurant, and you say, awesome idea, and I say, OK, let's do it, see you there, we can be fairly sure that we'll both end up there tonight. If, on the other hand, we spend the entire time just naming different restaurants and then leave, we're in trouble. So the question for the machine is, what about all the variations in the middle along that spectrum? How can it learn patterns of information exchange to figure out whether the team is in consensus? So we gave it a large, publicly available data set of team conversation, teams of four people doing the task of designing a remote control. They're deciding where the buttons go, how big the buttons should be, even how to market that remote control. We then took that machine and we put it to work with teams of two people performing a planning task, uh, and a planning task for emergency response, so something entirely different than the remote control task. What the machine did was ask the team to revisit topics it believed were weakly agreed upon, so that the team had a chance to develop stronger consensus. And what we found was that when the machine asked the team to review topics it felt were weakly agreed upon, the team left that meeting with much higher consistency in what they believed they agreed upon, a 17% improvement, and that was a statistically significant difference. In contrast, when the machine asked the team to visit topics it felt were already strong, there was no statistically significant difference in team consistency. So what this tells us is that the machine is learning meaningful patterns in this data, 
And not only that, but the machine can contribute to make the team better. People can learn from machines in group and team settings. OK, so I might know what you're thinking at this point. Um, you're thinking the machines are learning how we do our jobs. They're learning our weaknesses. And this is starting to make me nervous. <laughs> uh, so, well, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a fair point. Um, how long is it really till they take our jobs? How long is it really, for those that are a little further thinking, till they exploit our weaknesses? And this is the beginning of the end. <laughs> so this is what I believe. Human-machine collaboration is not something to fear. It's the key to making us be better superhuman performers. And being superhuman is hard. We really need the help. It's absolutely critical that we do think deeply about the uses and misuses of the technology that we develop. But headlines like machines and robots are going to take our jobs, they're going to rob us of our humanity, these headlines naturally elicit a negative emotional reaction in us. And it's not hard to trigger this emotional reaction. Even in our own studies, we see that if we have a team of people, we take out one person and we put in a machine, people start behaving differently and weirdly. Um, they, they start hoarding work, they start trying to actively decouple their work from the machine, and all of this is usually to the detriment of the team. So we need to understand that this seems to be some sort of hardwired emotional response in us. I see this in my work. Machines can make us better humans, both in individuals and in groups. Artificial intelligence that's designed to understand us and augment humans can help us to achieve our true, full human potential. And we need the help in all sorts of settings beyond resource optimization and scheduling. The world is increasingly full of vast amounts of data that we struggle to make use of. And this is a potential strength of machines. They can sort this data. They can find patterns that we might not otherwise see. But what we need to do is design them to understand how we would use that data so that they can understand how to communicate with us and that they can represent their information in ways that are useful for us. In one study we did in the lab, we designed a machine learning model that would take a huge database of recipes and all their ingredients and try to group the recipes according to ingredients. We then asked a person to come in and take a new recipe and try to assign it to the right group, the groups that the machine formed. We had the machine explain the groups in two different ways. One was the standard way, where it would take a group and it would look through the set of most representative ingredients across that group and use that as an explanation to the person for what made that group a group. In the other case, we had the machine use examples to explain the groups. Examples are intuitive, they're very useful for people. What we had to do is pick a representative recipe from that group and then provide the ingredients for that specific recipe. When the machine explained using examples, people were better able to classify that new recipe. They increased their accuracy in classification from 71% to 86%. That was a statistically significant difference. Humans and machines are not in opposition to each other, nor are the machines going to take over. Humans and machines have opposing but complementary strengths. We're like poles on two magnets. We can repel, but if we can just figure out how to align properly, we can fit together perfectly. Machines can help us indiv as individuals. They can change the way we work in groups. They can make us better. But we have to start seeing them that way and designing them to work with us rather than in opposition to us. Thank you.